please welcome back Courtney Maywald, Director of Marketing, Partner and Industry. I told you you were going to get sick of the sight of me. How are you all doing? Have they been taking good care of you while I haven't been here? Yes? Very good. So we are about to talk about something very important. Uh, it's important not just for you all in the audience in terms of your brands, it's also important for the LGBT plus community and all the other communities and all the other topics that brands like to align themselves with in terms of marketing around purpose. So we're going to start before we welcome some amazing panelists with some opening comments from our glorious CMO, Arian Dyke. Well, hello everyone, uh, it's me again. Uh, I will talk again for five to 10 minutes and it's really all around purpose. And it's something you read a lot about in the press. And you see here the title, Radical Authenticity. And we really care about that huh? because there's a lot of kind of nonsense going on, I think. And I will talk about that in a, in a little bit. And really the need for truth telling in, um, in, in purpose. Here you see the layout of the session. You know, I will talk for five to ten minutes and we have a beautiful panel uh, led by, by Courtney who will really go a bit deeper on our Travel Proud program. But I thought I'd put in chat GPT, what is brand purpose? And uh, this is the answer that I got back uh, and it's actually a pretty good answer. I don't know what you think. It's like, yeah, you know, pretty, pretty amazing. And, um, and I really like it. But when you really think about it, I think a lot of brands are getting it wrong. You know, a lot of brands, you know, define themselves around purpose and I don't think it's right. And I don't know how many of you have seen the Chris Rock special on Netflix, you know, where, where he makes fun of the yoga pants, you know, like yoga pants with a purpose of $100. He said, I prefer yoga pants of $20. And I really think that a lot of brands have to do a bit of soul searching. You know, how do you get it? How do you get it right? And we really believe that purpose is foundational and it's not kind of definitional. And when you think about it, I hope you will agree that it's just something you, know, you want to be doing. And I put that stat down of 82%, um, because when you talk about purpose, a lot of people say, well, it's mainly Gen Z, it's mainly millennials who care about it. And the reality is that probably all of us here in the room really care about doing business with, with companies that we like and that we feel contribute to a society. And if you really think about what the key ingredients are of purpose, I really, it all starts, I really think it all starts with an inspiring and easy to understand mission statement. And I don't know if you know the mission statement of Booking.com, but I think we have a very strong one. Huh? It, you know, it's to make it easier for everyone to experience the world. I'm really proud of that. Telling the truth, it's a bit like all of us being in a job interview, you know? Like, ideally you tell the truth about yourself, but you make it engaging and fun and, and that people connect with you. But it's really important you tell the truth about yourself and uh, about your brand and about your company. And I really care about that. And last but not least, idea and sustainability idea is inclusion, diversity, equality and accessibility and sustainability. You guys just saw this wonderful session before. It's really foundational and I really think it's very, very important. And the great work we all are doing on Travel Sustainable and we all need to work on this, you know, and I'm very proud on the progress we've made and we're really trying to help everyone in the industry to move things forward. And then we also have a Travel Proud program that we introduced under the banner of inclusion and, and, and diversity. And when you look at this program, we launched it two years ago, it's actually pretty amazing how the adoption has gone and, um, and I'm very happy with that. In 117 countries and 6,200 cities, yeah, we have rolled out the program, which is, um, which is pretty amazing. And I thought to keep you on your toes and awake, you know, like I will do a little quiz. So please lift your hands if you think that New York has the highest number of Travel Proud certified properties. No one thinks that, that New York is the highest. Oh my God, no one from New York here. Uh, Amsterdam, yeah, very, very good. Berlin, yeah, so, um, or Singapore. You know, you see, it's actually Singapore. Isn't that amazing? Wow, no? Um, really, really quite surprising. 
But the key thing is that, you know, we talked about purpose, you know, that the foundation of purpose is mission statement, it's really telling the truth, it's really all about idea, uh, inclusion, diversity, equality and accessibility and sustainability. And we want to deep dive a little bit more on the idea side of the house, the, the, the diversity side of the house. And I will hand over again to Courtney and the panel to really talk a bit more about that. Courtney, I hand it over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Arian. Amazing as always. I heard lots of gasps in the crowd as he revealed Singapore. It's great, right? Okay, so we are now fortunate enough to be joined by some very, very excellent panellists. So could you please welcome to the stage Clark, Rachel and Brimbell. Oh, she's outdressed me. How dare you, Rachel? Thank you so much for being here. I think we should start out, as I said, we have some exceptional panellists. I might get you all to start by introducing yourselves and explaining who you work for, uh, what you do, and why you're here today. Great. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Rachel Lowenstein. I use she, her pronouns. I'm the Global Head of Inclusive Innovation at Mindshare, uh, which has the immense privilege of working with Booking.com as their media agency. Uh, simply said, I help brands think about how they can use media, marketing, and technology for social good. Uh, I myself represent the B and the LGBTQ, uh, and I'm also autistic, which I think is important to highlight with the intersections of disability and neurodiversity in the community. Thank you, Rachel. Brimbell? Hi, everyone. My name is Brimbell. I identify as she, her, hers. Um, I'm the head of diversity, equity, and inclusion for Disneyland Paris where we have 17,000 employees working at the same place. They come from 120 different nationalities, and each of them represents different dimensions of diversity. So basically, my job is that all our employees and guests feel valued and welcome when they come to the park or to the office. To sum up, I'm trying to bring magic to everyone. Oh, thank you. Clark? <laughs> My name is Clark Massad. My pronouns are he, him, and his. I am vice president in charge of global partnerships for the International LGBTQ Plus Travel Association. IGLTA was created in 1983, so we're celebrating our 40th anniversary this year. And uh, our mission is to promote LGBTQ travel around the world, and we help our, our partners uh, to promote their travel-related products and services to LGBTQ travelers worldwide. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you so much for joining us. So the first thing I wanted to ask was a little bit in line with how we described this panel today, so you would have seen it in your app, which is around Gen Z. So we hear so much about Gen Z caring about brands having purpose. Rachel, could you maybe tell us, um, oh, Clark even, why uh, this is so important to Gen Z? I think it's extremely important to Gen Z and not just to Gen Z, but Younger generations today are hypersensitive to the core values, the mission, the, uh, the, the direction that a brand is going and how it's presenting its brand. And when you look at the LGBTQ community within that, they're even more sensitive to this. They want to engage with brands that are aligned with their own values and their own ideals. So they're taking a look at corporate social responsibility, they're taking a look at diversity, equity, inclusion, they're taking a look at belonging, they're looking on pages on your websites, are you engaging with the community or not? So it's very important that you as a brand are presenting whatever you're doing from a corporate social responsibility or a DEI standpoint. I agree with everything Clark said. The one thing that I would add is I think we have to acknowledge the immense failings that are happening in the public sector right now on protecting queer and trans rights, um, and in many cases actively removing rights from queer and trans communities. So this is no longer a conversation just about um, business impact, but increasingly tying business and social impact together. And frankly, a lot of communities, Gen Z being, being one of them in a lot of generations, can understand the role that the private sector can play with these struggles and sometimes the failings, if we're being honest, of the public sector today. Yeah, I think I will just add and build on Clark's comment on the fact that it's very important that you walk the talk in terms of diversity and inclusion. And to answer your question on Gen Z, for me, they care so much because they are the most diverse generation ever. 
So in the US, they are the more, most diverse in terms of um, racially and about, um, sorry, ethnically diverse. But on the LGBTQIA+, it's where it's very interesting for you and, and your marketing strategy. 20% of Gen Z identify as LGBTQIA+. And if you compare to millennials, they only identify as 10% as LGBTQIA+. So I think that's, that's very important. I think it's interesting, too. You said 20% of Gen Z identify as LGBTQIA+. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I got stuck on my braces there. Um, uh, but 10% of millennials, which is even higher than the generation before. So we're really seeing a steep incline in terms of people identifying or being comfortable coming out, if you will, in terms of identifying. Okay. So I think... What this leads into, it's important, but then we need to understand for everybody in the room, so how do we do this successfully? Because I read recently something that the thing with Gen Z is that they're not just digitally native, they're diversity native as well. They're sustainability native and really they're marketing native. So they have a very good, um, how do I say this politely, BS detector when it comes to marketing. So what are your tips for brands to successfully play in this space when it comes to Gen Z? From my perspective with the brands that, that I work with, it's a very simple question of, is this a marketing initiative or is this part of your business? Everything obviously comes back to marketing in some way and there should be a role for how you're marketing those initiatives. But if it's fundamentally antithetical to how you are operating as a business, they're gonna call you out on, on your shit. Um, because today, you know, I, I mentioned the legislative issues that we are seeing. I think a lot about the, the role that purpose marketing has had in the last 10 or 15 years with brands, and you can arguably make the, the statement that purpose marketing really flourished when we had legislative progress, especially for LGBTQ plus communities, even if it was a semblance of progress and we had small steps. Again, we're seeing a lot of that being rolled back, especially in the US with a record number of anti-LGBTQ bills, particularly targeting our trans siblings. So I think... We have to keep that in mind that the role of purpose marketing today is not the role that it was 10 years ago. I'm actually very optimistic because I think purpose marketing should be a lot more intentional and should be a lot more about how you were operating as a business, but it means that we have to be a lot more careful and thus more intentional with how we are acting. This goes back to the hypersensitive sensitivity that we were talking about earlier. Um, in this morning's session, uh, Booking was talking about building up trust. And I think that it's really uh, very much, very similar that brands need to build up trust with the communities that they're marketing to. Mm -hmm. So taking what Rachel said a step further, that you know, if it's not just a marketing issue, are you really changing the lives of the people that you're engaging with? So that is how you build up that trust. Uh, I have to say Booking's doing a really good job through their Travel Proud program because, yes, there's an aspect of that that is marketing, but the real promise behind that, the real delivery on that is that someone can come and stay in a property and be uh, sure that, that the property is delivering on that promise. Mm -hmm. And we have a program at IGLTA, IGLTA accredited, that fits very well within the Travel Proud program. The Travel Proud program is going to be one of the um, uh, training programs within our eight criteria. So that's about building up that trust and making it possible for people to really understand that it's a real deliver on a promise. Yeah. And if I go a step further, I will say it's important to have it in your DNA. So for example, at Disneyland Paris, until recently we had only four values and we just added the inclusion one. And that's very important. It means you really, you are aligned between what you're doing with your employees, with your guests, and also with association like working with Clark, for example. Fantastic, thank you. So something I want to call out, we've been talking a lot about Gen Z, but it also feels a little dangerous to me, like, Unless you're marketing to Gen Z specifically, you don't have to worry about any of this, you know. Um, is it just Gen Z that are interested in purpose or interested in LGBT progressive companies, for example? Absolutely not. I think that's a, a narrative in the marketing community that increasingly we're starting to deconstruct. I think it boils down to the fact that marketing has been very white, very heteronormative, very male-centered since its, its genesis, really. And because of everything that my fellow panelists have said with how increasingly Gen Z is diversified, and as I mentioned with this issue of legislative regression that's happening right now, 
we are seeing Gen Z being very loud about it, and rightfully so. And I love my Gen Z counterparts, but we're also, we know that other communities care about this. You know, my fellow millennials, we know that LGBTQ fucks, folks have been talking about this for a very long time. It's just that the marketing community has, in some ways, and maybe very unintentionally so, ignored the, the larger aspect of diversity and advertising beyond just representation, but making it holistic to your business. It's also the first generation that has really had the context, the vocabulary, the role models, and the opportunity to discuss these issues openly. Um, you know, younger, the, young, the Gen Z generation, they've grown up with LGBTQ parents, aunts, uncles, brothers, sisters, classmates, so it's become a part of their daily lives. And so that is, it, it starts with Gen Z, but it's, it's, it's bubbling up from that generation because they're talking to their parents and to their grandparents and to their, their friends and just making it more normalized as far as the conversation goes. Yeah, I concur with, um, with Clark. It's really bubbling up. So you're going to say, Courtney, I'm the statistic person here. It's okay. I'm just going to read it because I think it's important. 50% of Gen Z believe that traditional gender norms are outdated, and it's 56% for millennials. So it's not about Gen Z. It's bubbling up. So you have to take that into account. Yeah. Okay. So then what are some of the biggest watchouts? What can our audience take back to their marketing teams if they're not with us today? What are some of the biggest watchouts when it comes to marketing around purpose, particularly, you know, using LGBT+, which we're doing as an example today, but it's bigger than that. This is just around purpose in general. Maybe Brimbal? Yeah, sure. So I think for me, it's to use the right language, is to have the right representation, and it's really to um, to be surrounded by, uh, you know, advisor, consultant like Rachel, working with association, and thinking about DNI as a holistic approach. So I'll give you some concrete example. I was speaking about non-binary people, and I have some very interesting example from the travel industry. So in 2019, Air Italia was the first company to introduce. MX, so it's a non-binary gender option. And more recently, you probably saw that Virgin Atlantics introduced gender-neutral uniforms. So basically, you can choose whatever you want to wear. So if you're a male and you want to wear a, a skirt on your plane, it's fine. So for me, that's kind of concrete example that are very interesting. Mm. Just to add on to that, I think, you know, Brimbell highlighted this, but this is really why diversity on your teams is so important. You need people from the communities that you want to be reaching with your business in decision-making roles, helping you guide the, the decisions that you want to be making, because without that, you might get it wrong, and that's obviously a reputational risk for your brand and your business, which is, amongst other reasons, why having diversity and inclusion um, as part of your core business proposition is so important. I think one of, one of the challenges for the hotel industry, too, is the reservation systems. Um, you know, they're quite often very binary, male, female. Uh, many hotel chains, many hotel brands have started to introduce the non-binary gender marker in their reservation systems. The U.S. now allows uh, a non-binary gender marker on their passports. Um, we're seeing more and more airlines integrate that into their reservation systems. Delta Airlines is doing the same thing with uh, allowing its employees to wear whatever uniform they feel the most comfortable in. So it's it's about having the groups within the organizations, employee resource groups that help guide the decisions that are made within the organizations also, uh, and then relying on organizations that can help you and guide you along the way. Okay, love that. All right, let's keep going on this theme then. Okay. What are some ways, Clark, that brands can be true allies to the LGBTQIA plus community? I think it's committing to engaging with the community. And I mentioned employee resource groups. Some, some uh, uh, organizations call them business resource, resource groups or team member resource groups. Um, but it's very important to get the community involved and make sure that the community is part of the decision-making process and that they are involved in uh, moving things forward within the organization. Um, another way is to support local organizations, support local pride organizations. Um, 
LGBT, uh, the LGBT community is not limited just to nightlife. Um, it can be arts, it can be culture, it can be entertainment, anything else that is, whatever is right for your brand, whatever is on brand for you, whatever is right for your local community, that's the way to engage with your local LGBTQ community. I want to get um, quite specific now and maybe call out some things that brands do very often. Uh, so, for example, brands changing their logo during Pride Month to being a rainbow, for example. Um, maybe Rachel. Where do you see the line between representation and visibility, which we know is sort of one end of the, the spectrum, I guess, and then rainbow washing? I think it goes back to what I said earlier, which is a very simple exercise you can do with your teams and ask yourself, is this a marketing execution or is this how we operate as a business? Representation, visibility is extremely important, but arguably the LGBTQ plus community, we can represent ourselves, we can show ourselves, we have platforms that we've built for ourselves. What we really need from brands and what I work on with, with a lot of the brands that I consult on is economic empowerment, empowerment for the community through representation and visibility and giving us stages and giving us voices. I think that's the simplest way that you can think about this, marketing or business, that will probably unpack a lot of pain points, maybe problem statements that you need to solve for, and honestly, a lot of opportunities from a business perspective if you can really understand the impetus behind why you might be doing an execution. And it's not to say that brands can't show up in these places and spaces. They fundamentally should be, especially from an economic empowerment perspective. But it also means that you have to be very thoughtful about how you're entering these spaces. So we need to ask ourselves, why are we doing this? But when you say economic empowerment, can you give some examples of what that can actually mean? Yeah, definitely. And this is a topic I'm very passionate about. Mm -hmm. I think when we think about showing up at Pride, for example, the reason why there's a lot of conversation about whether or not brands just showing up at Pride and that is the only moment they're showing up in is either helpful or in some cases harmful to the community. What I mean by economic empowerment is actually investing in the community beyond those singular moments that might give a lot of buzz to your brand. That means investing in queer media, that means investing in LGBTQ plus influencers, that means showing up in Pride, but also showing up outside of the, the singular month at Pride at all of the other moments that the community might be celebrating 11 months outside of that year. And Rachel, at IGLTA, we say that Pride is 365 days a year. Um, if you look around the world, in the United States and North America, June is considered to be Pride Month. But there are many countries worldwide that do not celebrate their Pride events in the month of June. It's either too hot, it's either not the right season of the year. Um, so Pride is really 365 days a year. And I think it's very important to integrate exactly what Rachel just said as far as being mindful about it and looking at how you can have multiple touch points throughout the year to show your commitment to the community. And I guess to have different touch points, it's important to also do some awareness to your staff. So, for example, all year long, we have some training at Decent Paris. I developed one on gender transition. You can do, like, for example, awareness about using the right pronoun. It's very important for people who identify as non-binary or would just transition. Um, so I think it's very important to have this, you know, once again, to think about how your employee will be trained. Because if, if, if that person is well trained, She's going to serve your guests very well. So it's, you know, in an inclusive manner. And to come back to your point as well on Pride Month, so for example, what we do as well is we have a Pride collection, like a lot of different companies. So we sell merchandise with Rainbow and Disney and, you know, key rings or T-shirts, you name it. But what we do is any benefits we make on that collection is given back to the community, to your point. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, we work with them throughout the year as advisor, as consultant. They come to speak to our conferences. So it's not only you know, June. It's a year-long I mean, year engagement. Okay, I think you've landed this, but I'm going to ask you to do it in a sentence <laughs> just so everybody can hear this loud and proud. How do you feel about brands that participate in pride marketing but nothing the rest of the year? Clark? I think they're missing out on a huge opportunity. They are only looking at one portion of the, of, of the, of the picture, one portion of the puzzle. Um, uh, they're starting down a pathway, 
it's a journey. Um, it is uh, about a, an overall engagement, but they're missing out on the opportunity to engage with their own employees. They're missing out on the opportunity to engage with their customers. They're missing out on the opportunity to gauge with other, engage with other brands as well that are part of that space. And I think they're missing out as well on recruiting the best talent and just retaining your talents as well. Because, for example, if you do your job offer and you just put male, female on top of it and you don't put non-binary, maybe some talent will not even apply. And once they come into your company, if they don't feel welcome, they will leave as well. So I think you have to think about that as well. You know, it's very important. Absolutely. Yeah, I have two answers to this from slightly different vantage points. The first is I completely agree with Rambel and, and Clark. The LGBTQ plus community is a growth opportunity for your brand. And I retweet everything that both of y'all just said that thinking about pride is a, a business opportunity that you're, you're missing if you're not thinking about every other moment. The other thing that I will say, it's important to remember that pride is a protest and increasingly with, with the attack on human rights, we have to keep that in mind as marketers that and it honestly ties back into my first point, which is if you're just showing up at Pride, you're missing a business opportunity. But if you're also just showing up at Pride, there's a lot on the table right now as it relates to human rights. And, and brands that want to grow with the LGBTQ plus community have to keep that in mind in order to do this, not only ethically, but sustainably and from a growth perspective as well. And, and if I can add, Connie, yeah, we, we're missing out on creativity because if you have a team who's diverse, you're going to be more creative. And there are very interesting studies, actually, from how do you can struggle. So the, the company that were most inclusive before COVID were actually more su successful. They navigated through the COVID in a better way, and they perform, their performance financially were better as well. And guess why? Because they had some creativity there, and it it's all comes to that as well, you know. And I know you wanted just one sentence, but the brands are also missing out on an opportunity to differentiate themselves from other yeah. brands. Mm -mm. Yeah. And I think that's really important because they may be the leaders in their space, in their, you know, in their vertical. They may be the leader in their space and they may have an opportunity to say, okay, we're taking a stance on this issue. And whether it's a, a protest or political standpoint or looking at the creativity issue of it, it's an opportunity to differ differentiate your brand. And I think just remembering back to one in five Gen Z identify as LGBTQIA+, but the four in five are very likely to care about these issues. Right. So it's not just the community, it's everyone who cares about the community too. And okay. hopefully the fifth one is an ally. That's exactly yes. what you would hope, exactly. Yeah. Brimbell, who's getting it right? Which brands are getting it right in this space? <laughs> So I know you asked me to speak only about travel, but I wanted to give an example of Calvin Klein fashion, sorry. <laughs> so disobedient, this panel, my goodness. No, I, really, I wanted to share something they did, which is very nice. They worked with PFLAG, an American association, on having an inclusive experience for people who come to their shops. So it's not only about not organizing the shop between male and female, it's also when someone comes, you don't say, oh, hi, Mister, can I, you know, can I help you? You, you, very, um, you train the staff, you think about the clothesline, you think about how you arrange the shop. And it was a one-year project, and obviously at the end you have advertisement and marketing. But all of that shows that if you do it, once again, with this holistic approach, I think you get it right, because you consumers, you Gen Zen going to see, it's an authentic way to do it, I think. You walking the talk. Sorry, it was fashion. Oh, know. it's absolutely fine. <laughs> I actually have an example that's also outside of the category, but I think you can learn a lot of inspiration, sorry, Courtney, from this, this case study. Um, and I really encourage y'all to look this up if you haven't seen it. I think it came out about, it came out just before the pandemic, if I'm remembering correctly. Um, it was a Starbucks execution in Brazil. And what Starbucks did is they transformed their stores into notary locations so trans folks could legally change their names on all of their legal documents in Starbucks stores. Um, I actually get very emotional every time I think about this campaign because it's such a simple but powerful example of how you can use your IP, how can you, you can use your brand to materially change the lives of LGBTQ plus people, as, as Clark said, if it's a marketing opportunity or if you're changing somebody's, somebody's lives in the community, the latter is really where you can lean in and, and grow and, and change what's happening in the world today. 
And I love the Starbucks execution because they use their physical space as something that became an advocacy space for LGBTQ folks, mm -hmm. particularly in the trans community. And I think that's a really interesting insight to think about. How can you use your owned and operated properties, your, um, the IP that you own, to actually create change and be a solution for the community. So definitely look up that case study if you haven't seen it. It's, it's incredible. Such a nice tie to their brand too. Obviously, your name being such a big part exactly. of the Starbucks experience. Exactly. I love that. As a marketer, I also really love that. Yeah, very the, clever. the insight they were working yeah. on was exactly that. Exactly. So it's, it's very smart. Yeah. From a, from a travel standpoint, I can list dozens of travel brands that are doing it right. Um, Hilton, Marriott, uh, Disney, Delta Airlines, uh, that are all including LGBTQ imagery in their marketing. Um, they are supporting the communities also. Uh, Qantas Airlines just recently did a Pride flight from Los Angeles to Sydney for World Pride in Sydney. And the experience started the minute you got on, the minute you arrived at the airport with uh, a reception in the lounge and everything was LGBTQ themed, drag queens, rainbows, you know, everywhere. So uh, it's, it, it was really an amazing um, uh, opportunity for them to put their brand forward as being supportive of the community. And then they had activations, obviously, in Sydney on site. Mm -hmm. um, so we see a lot of brands that are really going deeper and diving in deeper and getting engaged with the community and involving community, the community as part of their marketing efforts. Okay, I love it. I'm sure a lot of the brands you just mentioned are in the room with us today. And if they're not, they will be in the room with us in Miami <laughs> next week. So well done, everybody, that you just got a shout out uh, to. Okay, final question for me, and then I'm going to talk to you about your breakouts. Clark, um, what about us personally? So we're all here representing brands, but we also travel extensively, all of us, I'm sure, not just for business, but also for leisure. How can we get it right? So um, specifically, should we be traveling to destinations that are not LGBTQIA plus friendly? And if we do, or when we do, or when we have to, how can we make sure that we're making those visits as an ally? You know, this is a very important question. Um, there are 70 countries in the world where it's a crime to be LGBTQ. Uh, and about a dozen of those countries, it is punishable by death sentence. So it's very important for travelers to know and be informed of where they're going and make everybody's going to have to make a decision that is right for them. Um, our travel advisors tell us that their clients want to go to some of the countries where it is a criminal offense to be a member of the LGBTQ community or same-sex uh, relationships are uh, criminalized. So they say, look, I would really rather that they travel with me and that I can go and mitigate any problems that might arise rather than them just going on their own and, and not being informed uh, about the destination they're going to. We have travel guides on our website that help people in making those decisions. Um, uh, IGLTA's stance on this is that boycotts are not uh, an effective way of, um, uh, of, of changing uh, minds. Um, one of the things that uh, was said earlier this morning is that travel is a force for change, and we believe the same thing, that by going there and interacting and engaging with the local LGBTQ community, we can find ways to help that community emerge more and uh, become more active in helping to make laws change also. So seek out the local gay bars. Yes. Also very fun. <laughs> Highly recommended. <laughs> it's a good place to start. It's a good place to start. <laughs> yeah, the one thing I would add to everything that Clark said is you have to do it intentionally. You have to do it thoughtfully. Um, I agree with Clark, the, the idea that isolating these communities in these countries will likely just isolate them further. But again, it has to be done with a lot of intention and ethics while you're making those decisions, if it's the right decision for you. I concur with Clark and Rachel. So I think you have to do it intentionally and I will encourage dialogue as well because I think it's a way that we can progress. So. Thank you all so much. And I think what Clark said in terms of the, another, uh, the number of countries where it's still illegal, it's punishable by death. If you were wondering why this panel is important and why these panelists are important, I hope that says it all. So thank you very, very much to all of you. Thank you.